Well, good morning. This is Meg Riley in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I hate to say it, but global climate change is really working for us. It has been a very mild winter. I haven't even put on the Gore-Tex yet. So I'm, I'm a happy camper just back from the dog park. Aisha, how are you? Hi, I'm Aisha Hauser and I'm in Seattle. Um, it's been raining quite a few days in a row here, which people, when I say that people go, duh, it's Seattle, but actually we've had a lot of sun thanks to global warming the whole five years I've been here. So for me, who's not a Seattle native, this is quite unusual this many uh, rainy days in a row, but otherwise I'm, um, ah, I'm doing okay. I'm meh, I'm doing okay, it's busy and lots of stuff. So um, Christina, how are you? Hey everybody, Christina Vivetta joining you from uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, where we have um, had our fourth day of inclement weather. Um, we had closures Monday and Tuesday, and then, you know, two hour delays for the kids yesterday and today from the ice that came from all that, which just proves that, uh, yeah, the climate change is real, and we just, we're going to have to figure things out a little bit better here in the northern south with our, with our weather patterns. Um, but yeah, it's, it's nice to see, um, we're going to get some rain tomorrow, which is great for, for getting all the ice and everything out. Michael, how are you doing? I am doing just great. Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino joining you from Peekskill, New York, where, um, it's kind of snowing right now. I mean, flurries. There are like nine flakes that I can see outside my window right here. Peekskill? Uh, Peekskill. Uh, that's, Peekskill? that's where I live, Meg. Uh, Peekskill, New York, right here <laughs> on the really Hudson River. Shocked. I am a really sure. <laughs> this is my house uh, here in Peekskill, uh, about 35 miles north of New York City on the Hudson River. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's I'm in denial that Christmas is um, 12 days from now, which means Christmas Eve is 11 days from now. And I just I have no idea what's happening at 5 p.m. in my worship service that day. So um, so I'm taking advantage of these 12, now 12 flakes of snow to cancel my uh, community office hours this afternoon and figure out Christmas Eve. Um, and, and Jessica, how are, how are you out there in the Seattle area? Well, you know, the rain, I was just saying before the show started that the rain is my favorite. And it's actually the summertime that stresses me out because I don't like all the pressure to go outside and enjoy it. So all this rain is fantastic. I'm in my happy place. Um, I am on the Facebook live chat. There's already people messaging me on there and, and active on there, which is really exciting. And then I'm on um, Twitter, hashtag the view, and I'm passing all of your comments and questions and hellos along to our hosts and guests. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here and have Michael Crumpler on today. So this is exciting. Before we get to our special guest, Michael Crumpler, and we will, and we're quite excited about talking with him, a couple of things. The first, and this is a rare thing, but I'm doing it, uh, CLF produces this and brings it to you each week with the wonderful help of three volunteers. But I wanted to say that if you have not given money, but you appreciate this, it does actually cost money for us to create it and to do everything else that we do. I know we all feel like if it's on the web, it's free, but actually Jessica and I are, you know, we're making, we're, well, a living, maybe Jessica is, is stretching it, but you know, we're, we're trying to support the Church of the Larger Fellowship. So if you've already given, thank you so much. Thank you to those who give their time as well. If you have been saying what, you know, this is so helpful. Religious professionals say to me all the time, you have conversations on The View I can never get to in my congregation. I am so grateful to be able to listen. I'm so grateful to get the perspectives that you bring. I'm so grateful that you're not just dealing with pushback all the time and you can actually present things that are kind of on the edge of our faith anyway. <laughs> um, so I, I, really, um, I really value this time that we spend together. I really value lifting up anti-oppressive ways to think about our faith and, um, and really the time to think together. So if you value it too, and you've been thinking, gee, I'd like to support those people, now's the time. We're doing a 10 days to 10K fundraiser. And we're on day three, and I think we've taken in about $1,000. So if you've been putting it off, it would really show support for the view, and we would know that you liked it if you gave money today. I also want to give a pitch. <clears throat> CLF is 
to me, the heart of what we could be as a faith as Unitarian Universalists. And I actually just got an email recently from um, a friend who's not anywhere near me is on the East Coast who said, I'm really, I have to leave my congregation. I don't know what to do. I said, join CLF. And they were very happy about that and didn't hadn't even thought about that as an option. Um, and I agree with Meg. I get people all the time who have who say they listen to the podcast of The View. They don't even watch it. And they say, oh, I download it while I'm walking my dog. I listen to it. And and thank you. And so and the prison ministry and your um, genuinely having a place uh, where you affirm the fullness of people's humanity in a way that I think is the closest to who we say we are as Unitarian Universalists. So I am. I was just saying to Meg, it's I'm going to be given within these 10 days for sure, in addition to my pledge. So I absolutely, the CLF has a special place in my heart right there next to blue and drum. <laughs> um, so please absolutely give. And and I will, I don't know if I'll round out the, pl the plugs, maybe not, um, but I just encourage folks, you know, if you've ever, if you're not a member of CLF, but you've ever referred people to CLF, um, it would be great if you also supported CLF. So Church of the Larger Fellowship is one of those great places that we can tell people, hey, yeah, you, you need a space, you need a place to plug in, you know, go to the Church of the Larger Fellowship. Um, which is fabulous. Keep those referrals coming. But if you could also support CLF um, during these these uh, 10 days, you know, that would be fabulous as well. So keep the referrals coming, but uh, send, send CLF some, some cold hard cash as well. Thanks so much. I didn't pay them for that, just, just to be clear. <laughs> so um, we also wanted to talk a little bit before we um, launch into a exciting conversation with Michael Crumpler, who is the director of the LGBTQ and intercultural programs at the UUA, and I'll introduce him more fully later. But Christina, you wanted to share a story from yesterday. So um, folks who are watching or who hear this podcast um, may know that yesterday um, the announcement from the UUA Board of Trustees went live and public that I've resigned my first position as a trustee and as secretary of the association. Um, I had been in conversation with the board um, actually since October um, about leaving and I, um, my term, uh, my resignation is effective at the end of this month of December. Um, but we really wanted to um, roll that out with some care and um, a statement from both the UUA, the, the co-moderators and myself um, and so that went live yesterday, and um, I wasn't exactly sure when it was going to happen. So as I saw the, um, the announcement come through on social media, um, you know, I, I uh, shared on my own personal um, page as well. And what I wanted to say about that, um, there's a lot I want to say about, you know, the reasons why I, I uh, had to resign. Um, and I will, but not in this space. But what was really interesting to me is I made a decision early on in the day that I was going to, um, you know, post about it, um, also include my own resignation letter because that wasn't included in the fullness of the statement. Um, and then I wasn't going to post anymore for the day. I, I didn't want to respond to individuals and not to everybody. I didn't feel like I could take the time to really um, do it justice. And, and also it was really hard um, um, spiritually and emotionally. It was just really, really hard. It's not how I wanted to end um, my trustee term. Um, so it was really interesting to me to see throughout the day kind of the trajectory of the comments on, on my post, on the UA's post. On, um, it was shared a lot of times on different people's Posts. And in the morning, it was like, oh, we're so sorry, you know, this, thank you for your service. Um, and there was a lot of that. And then about midday, there was um, a couple of people who, two individuals who said, no, this, this is really fucked up. Like this, she's not, you know, just resigning to go spend some more time with her family, quote unquote. Like the reasons behind this are really um, wrong. And 
we're not sorry, we're mad, we're angry, we're, we're angry that this has happened and this is the result of it. Um, and then as the day went on towards the evening, it really became much more, we're mad, we're angry, we're sad, and what, what is gonna be done about this? And DRUM and um, Allies for Racial Equity, who we just had on The View the past couple of episodes, um, everybody should check those episodes out, um, came through and said, you know, what does is, what is restorative justice look like? In, in this, how are we changing the way we are as Unitarian Universalists when things like this happen so that we don't just say, oh, we're sad, thank you for your service. But what does being a faith that calls for us um, to return again and again, how can we do that and, and not also practice restorative justice? So, um, I'm just, I'm grateful for kind of where we ended the day with that, um, because in the morning it did feel like, um, I really appreciated what people had to say, you know, in terms of feeling sad, um, and thanking me for my service, but in the end, that's really not what this is about, and, um, so I'm, I'm grateful that, to, to have seen that trajectory, and, I hope that we continue to hold that, um, not just for me, um, but for um, you use of color and um, you know, you trans, our trans siblings of color, um, our trans siblings, you know, there's so many people who are marginalized in our world and even further so within Unitarian Universalism, um, our disability community. Um, I, I think it's really, really important that that we continue to um, look at that trajectory and, and maybe sometimes maybe start a little bit more in the middle of that anger place <laughs> and get to um, the, the place where we're actually gonna be doing something about this. Because I think that if all of this was, if everything I and my family have gone through was just for people to say, oh, we're so sorry and this is so sad, um, that would be the tragedy. Well, I was off social media yesterday and hadn't heard that whole story, but it is heartbreaking and it is infuriating because it happened to you, as we've said before, it has happened to so many leaders of color and the brilliant leadership and perspective that you bring, the loss of that on the board is a loss for the whole movement. And, and I'm really glad that somebody's bringing up restorative justice. And I, um, you know, I've been looking into what the UUA is doing with restorative justice. And there are some people doing some stuff. I'd like to have a show about it, but we've, <laughs> in terms of just within the movement, I'm not even talking about reparations. <laughs> I just mean within our movement, um, envisioning what that could look like is really critical task. So, yeah. And also who does, who, with, with what I experienced after the initial spring of our discontent um, was there, there was a, a, it seemed to be, there was a rush to take care of the ordained men. And, and people making, I don't want to say excuses, but, oh, you know, the money that went out, like there was definitely a large, a segment of folks who were just completely fine with people not taking responsibility for harm caused and getting, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> some kind of amends made for people who caused the harm, but then the people who were the, um, have been harmed so, so who, who even deserves respiratory? So let's, let's like expand our notion of who is worthy. It, you know what I've said over the past few months that Unitarian Universalism cannot only be safe for ordained people. Christina and I are lay leaders who, you know, Christina is absolutely, I mean, I'm, I'm outraged over what she's been through even more. I've had a, a some of it, but not at all what, what her, Christina and her family have had. Um, and because we're lay leaders and not ordained, somehow it's, we get patted on the head like, oh yeah, 
sucks, doesn't it? Oh, shucks. And, you know, and there's something fundamentally wrong in our, in our faith that that's okay, that there is, that there are tears of who gets to be protected and who gets to be uh, worthy of repairing the harm in a systemic way. But I want to say that I've watched a lot of ordained people of color get this same, I mean, Yes, ordained people are more protected than not ordained people, but I feel like racism cuts across all of those. Very true. Absolutely. So, yeah. But I think that the point you raise about who, who is worthy is reminiscent of, oh, poor Brent Kavanaugh. You know, I mean, it is like, wait a minute, who, who are we looking at? Who are we thinking about? Michael Crumpler, it looks like you can't wait. Did you want to come into the conversation? I see you unmuted. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to raise that impact. I think whenever you said people of color, um, you know, not necessarily being uh, treated a certain way, and I think it cuts, a, it, 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 it comes across as a, as a little bit more of an injury because in our culture, uh, people of color in ministry, I'll just say the black church, um, are, are held in, in such a high regard um, and by lay leaders and there's just a much more um, respectful relationship and I feel like in, in, in liberalism there's a casualness about faith anyway and when when people of color are not treated with um, dignity and respect uh, in our faith communities it's almost a double injury because you know I, naturally we, we we come from I come from a space where I'm a reverend and I'm treated a certain way. Not that I believe that I deserve that or I'm entitled to that, but I think that having to um, advocate for yourself uh, when something happens um, makes it even more difficult. This, this year, I, um, you know, as a lay leader in my congregation, uh, found myself in a situation where, you know, I had to, you know, as board chair, advocate for myself and defend myself in the face of, you know, a majority white congregation. And it was very, very difficult. And to figure out how to navigate the system, how to protect myself, how to lead them and teaching them how to treat me, it was very, very heavy. And I feel like that is the burden of, of being a person of color and leadership in leadership in, in a white progressive space where you have to like treat, teach people how to treat you, take care of yourself, negotiate self-care, you know, uh, address white supremacy in the process while while surviving. And it's 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 a lot. You may be wondering who was that brilliant person who just said all that. So I'm going to introduce Michael Crumpler now and, and we'll continue this conversation. But uh, Reverend Michael J. Crumpler began at the UUA as LGBTQ and Intercultural Programs Manager in early 2017. He's ordained in the United Church of Christ as a reverend. He lives in Harlem and is very active in social justice ministry at the historic Judson Memorial Church of New York City and the surrounding queer community. He's most passionate about intersectional ministry centered in blackness, queerness, HIV, AIDS, economic justice, and emotional well-being. Welcome, Michael. And thanks for jumping in. Christina, it looked like you wanted to say something. Oh, I was actually going to uh, read you. Karen um, Ole uh, had a comment in the chat, and she said, um, our culture prioritizes punishment over justice. And it really shows when we talk about restorative justice, it doesn't compute for most people. And that is uh, like so true. I mean, I think that's why we've seen the explosive growth of the industrialized prison complex, because the idea that somehow we can remove people and punish them, and that is justice, um, you know, it has exploded in so many ways, not just about criminal, you know, criminal justice, but we see it in the, our detentions of our immigrants. We see it in, you know, in, as she said, in our culture, um, that thought that somehow punishment equals justice. Um, and when we talk about restorative justice, um, people are like, now, now what now? Like how, how is it that that could possibly work if you're not hurting somebody? 
um, in order to get justice. Um, and that's really where I see our faith struggle. Um, when we when we see harms done, we think that that to make that right means we want to we need to hurt somebody else, and we're unwilling to do that, rightfully so. So we do nothing, um, and that paralyzes us from moving forward. Um, and what you're saying theologically is Calvinism. Some people deserve to be damned. And that is our culture writ large. And our faith should tell us, no, actually, we know a different holiness. We know a different place where the sacred lives. And we're going to fight for it because it is what we're made of. And I think, um, Michael, what, Michael Crumpler, what you were just saying is that's where liberal religion really struggles, is in daring to proclaim that we actually have a theology that compels us to take bold action, as opposed to kind of a theology that coasts along with a generally acceptable white supremacist culture. So, yeah. yeah and I will, I'll just add that I used paralyze in a, in a very ableist language right there. And I apologize for that there. Um, what I meant to articulate is that it makes us unable to move towards justice. I love watching you do that, Christina. You really um, catch yourself. I didn't even hear that, so thank you. So Michael Crumpler, tell us what you're up to in the LGBTQ and intercultural programs. I hear you're doing some cool stuff. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a privilege to be uh, invited to, to share the work that we're doing in multicultural ministries uh, at the at the UUA, uh, and it's a privilege to be doing that work as well. Um, and it's great to see the faces that I can see and feel the spirit of the voices, uh, the folks that are typing in the chat, and the spirit of of those who I know are listening. So it's great to be here. So uh, as mentioned, I'm the LGBTQ and intercultural programs manager uh, at the UUA. Um, I always tell folks it's 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 you know. It's the job of a lifetime for me. Uh, I uh, have always been queer, but always been a person of faith. And, uh, you know, in my experience, particularly coming, growing up in the South, those two, um, the, neither the two shall meet. <laughs> and, and, and they have met in, in this faith and in this role and in the work that I get to do. So I uh, have so much joy and that I get to do it from my living room oftentimes. Where are you, Michael? Where do you live? In, 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 in New York City, in, in Harlem. So I'm I not said far that, from- I said that, didn't I? I'm, I'm I, like having a thing today. So no, yeah. No, no, I, I love saying it, that, didn't I, get I love it. living here. And if I look out, if I look really like, you know, out of my back window here, I can see Michael Tino. Um, you know, <laughs> my window faces north. So I'm sure, hey, so, um, so yeah, um, I live in New York City, and and it's and it's great here. Uh, here in the city, I uh, attend Judson Memorial Church. Uh, I am um, United Church of Christ uh, by faith and ordination, as well, and and uh, and I'm always running around the city doing work. Uh, but to your question, um, the latest thing happening uh, within our staff group is our. Um, attempt and, and efforts which which seem to be going really really well to uh revise and perhaps update our welcoming congregation program particularly the renewal process and um so today i'd like to talk with folk about that and i'm always excited um you know anytime i get to talk about it because you know uh there's a lot of a lot of congregations, over a thousand congregations, uh, who 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 are impacted by this change, and and it's not always, you know, as many opportunities to talk about it, and many uh, uh, you know, ways to engage people are great. So um, the new program is called the Five Practices of Welcome Renewal, and uh, the idea is to move us away from more of this like research this what I consider to be a research dissertation. Uh, approach to welcoming congregations 
and into a, a, a lived experience, a practice, ongoing practice of welcome renewal. In the past, uh, our welcoming congregations program has been something that um, congregations self-select, which means that congregations decide to, to what degree that they choose to opt into the program. Many congregations are welcoming. We have over 800 welcoming congregations. And the, and the expectation is that after five years, those congregations would renew. Well, five years, you know, five years is, is, is an eternity in not just ministry, but in LGBTQ world. Uh, as you can tell, a lot has happened in the last five years. And so uh, there's the issue of five years being, being five years. And then there's the issue of staff turnover at the UUA. There's the issue, there's the issue of staff turnover in congregations. And there's a issue of leadership changes in congregations compounded with new people coming into congregations, <laughs> right? And so as you can tell, it's a hot mess <laughs> as it relates to what congregations are doing, how we track it, uh, how we make sure, how we ensure that the congregations have resources in order to do that work and that the resources are, um, are relevant to the work. So th that's a lot. So hopefully, uh, so as I was thinking through uh, how to approach this issue, um, uh, the best way I felt like we could do it is create a way for congregations to number one, uh, in engage LGBTQ experience throughout the year. Many congregations are already doing <laughs> renewal. It's just not being recognized by the institution. Uh, and, and then, so, but, and now that's, that's one side of it. And on the other side of it, congregations are, um, are not being resourced and supported by the institution as well. So it's, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a dual issue. So the five practices of welcome essentially encourages congregations once you become welcoming. So the essential work is still necessary, um, you know, with engaging congregational life, changing your bylaws, uh, taking a look at, uh, you know, your infrastructure around uh, tr accommodations for, for trans and non-binary folks, uh, you know, inclu gender inclusive language, hiring practices around LGBTQ. Those essential things are, are, are important and foundational. But beyond that, you know, ensuring that congregations are, are, are honoring our days of observance throughout the year, that's important. It may not seem so, but it's important and it doesn't take a lot to do, you know, especially when our, when our, when our beautiful church polity allows, you know, includes chalice lightings and stories for all ages and music and, 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 and preaching, uh, and, but just naming, uh, a lot of these things are easy to do. Also, um, coming alongside of, uh, organizations that are doing the work, recognizing that we are, uh, a, a religious community, a faith community, and that that is our um, primary, and a lot of that includes justice, but there's a lot of um, organizations that we're able to flank. That's a UU term that I've learned since I've been working here. They were able to flank uh, institutions that are doing the work um, in your communities and, and both nationally, whether it be the Trevor Project or whether it be your local LGBTQ center, Ensuring that your support, we're supporting them in the work by um, with with financial resources as well as human resources uh, when when possible, um, and then obviously uh, you know offering religious education uh, such as webinars and seminars and workshops and conferences, many conferences that is, or partnering with your with your region to provide some type of an annual event where folks are learning what the newest issues are. Um, and so I'm gonna, uh, I'm talking through it now, but we do have a presentation to more sy systematically explain to you how it will work. But before I do that, um, I guess we could have a small conversation together and, and I can invite folks to engage via chat um, as well as to what this sounds like and, and, and how, how your ears and hearts and minds are receiving it. I've always had a question. When I first became UU about whatever it was, 900 years ago, um, I, I heard the word welcoming congregation. And actually this was when I first visited, like, oh, we're a welcoming congregation. And I was like, that's awesome. And then I learned it was only about one group of people. And then I was like, um, 
that's awesome because I think we yes and it still feels kind of lacking in intersectionality and it's I of course of course I affirm LGBTQI folks and we need to um set all of that up and I still I guess the word welcome the, I, I'm still curious and wondering that this whole program applies to one group of people and maybe it's more intersectional now and I definitely have not read anything of the update in the new and just to let you know the congregation where I am I think they did this come out in the 90s 80s yes. 90s yeah they haven't renewed I don't think actually 90 yeah I don't think I, I mean they're proud to be a welcome be a con welcoming congregation um but have I don't think I don't think they've ever renewed since the first time so this is exciting yeah so what's that point right I think that um a, a, a little bit of context is provided. The slides I've sort of started, usually I've been doing orientations and they've usually taken about an hour. So I, I, I cut down the presentation drastically, but in the presentation, I usually talk a little bit about the history of welcoming congregations and, and the context out of which it came. And, and, uh, and, and so welcome was, I mean, let's be real, <laughs> you know, it was, it was not intersectional and, and, uh, and in a lot of ways it's not. However, um, uh, as my bio indicates, I am very intersectional sectional in my in my work, and so I can't there's I can't come at things one two dimensional or one dimensional. So um, intersectionality will be a part of welcoming, and I think that and I'm working with other partners to ensure that when we talk about welcome, you can't be welcoming to LGBTQ folk if you're not welcoming to LGBTQ people of color, and you can't like it's just not you can't be welcoming to LGBTQ people without remembering there's a T in LGBTQ and, 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 and knowing the moment that we're in. So um, yeah, uh, I do wish to address that, but like just, you know, I think, I think you're, you were uh, accurate in your assessment that welcome did not include everyone. If it had, we wouldn't be where we are. We would, well, we would have been where we are a long time ago earlier. So can I interject a word? Because I actually was the director of that office when it came into being. Um, I mean, I inherited the language and actually the program. I did not create it, mm -hmm. but I was there as it came into being. And we did a, the, the only training to my knowledge we did, I made sure that all of the trainers were multiracial um, groups. But what's true about that curriculum, which again, I inherited is there's no power analysis in it at all. Mm -hmm. So it's a very friendly kind of um, diversity training, I'd say. But I think that the power analysis, uh, and when I was actually delighted was with the marriage equality thing is when people started to look at actual privileges. And some of our ministers said, I'm not marrying anybody until there's equality. And that felt more like people were getting power. But what um, I actually had a sign on my door when I worked there that said, this is not the office of white upper middle class men uh -huh. because so many people were mad at me because of the things I was working on. And they were saying, those aren't queer things. The word queer wasn't used yet, but I was like, who do you think's queer? Like, you know, who do you think suffers most from the lack of uh, marriage equality? I can use race privilege to get somebody into a hospital room, you know? And so I feel like, um, Yes, um, Asia just said the original program was very white comfort centered. Yes, it was a very much of a soft sell, but getting to it was a huge deal because there were a lot of people who didn't want anything to happen. And um, so it, it was a huge, huge deal to even get it done at the time in 1990 or whenever it was written. But um, yeah, you're absolutely right, Michael. And I'm so excited about where you're taking it now. So say more. Yeah, so um, I mean, I want to. I love saying this, and 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 I, I believe it so deeply. Primarily because I I, I often put, when I when I in, when I bring race uh, discussions of race and, and and queerness into this conversation, I, I I loved reminding people that many people. If we were to do a Venn diagram of people of color and queer people, many people of color in Unitarian Universalism are queer. If I were not queer, I probably would not, I probably would be attending a much different religious space. And so uh, welcoming LGBTQ people and welcoming people of color 
Um, it's not welcoming two different communities, it's welcoming the same communities because many of us who are of color are only in white liberal churches because we're queer, because of the theology and, and because of almost, in my case, a spiritual sanctuary. You know, so I can't, you know, wall off my experience as a black gay man from my experience as a gay man. You know, the two are, 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 are very much the same and how I move through the world and how I uh, receive messages and interpret them and send them back out uh, have a lot to do with my social location as a black man and as a queer man and how those two have, have uh, you know, wrestled with one another, if you will. So thank you so much. That was what I love uh, talking about. And, 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 and sharing. So as far as the five pillars of welcome, uh, Jessica, are you able to And So we're loading up. Uh, Michael, um, keep in mind as you describe it, the, a lot, the majority of people listen to this and don't see it. So thank um, you so much. The yes. majority of people will hear this. And, and, and it's more for me than for them because it keeps me with, <laughs> it, it keeps me on pace. And so I, there, there are no videos or images per se. It's really more just to make sure that I'm thoroughly and clearly articulating um, the program. So the new uh, frame, really, it's really more of a frame than, than a program. The new frame is considered the five practices of welcome renewal. And, um, Again, the goal is to encourage congregations once you become welcoming, not to just, you know, once you get the, the letter from the UUA, disband your welcoming congregations committee and say, yay, we did it and we have our logo and we just need to get our ribbon at GA. Um, we're welcoming, uh, but to, to, for that not to be the end, but to be a beginning. And uh, the hope is that, um, once you become a welcoming congregation, the five practices of welcome will, will kind of guide your congregation and move your congregation forward and ensuring that you're naming uh, and, and, and engaging the LGBTQ community. So the five practices of welcome are one, um, become a welcoming congregation. So the, it's really the, the, the four practices, but, you know, um, but, but, you know, like, indulge me. <laughs> so the five practices of welcome, the first practice, practice of welcome is become a welcoming congregation. Uh, 800, we have 845 uh, welcoming congregations. So there's still about 300 congregations that have not, uh, uh, I guess, formally become welcoming congregations. So we're still working with those congregations to ensure that they do the work. Uh, to become a welcoming congregation. But the other four pillars are one, uh, uh, you know, program or schedule welcoming worship services into your programming year, however you, however you do that over the course of 52 Sundays, ensuring that at least two of those Sundays are, um, are dedicated to um, centering the LGBT community specifically in your worship services. Again, many congregations are doing that but we wanted to uh, essentially share resources. So there are congregations that are doing it and who do it well. There are congregations that don't do it or they might name it, but not necessarily understand what it would be like to, to do that. And so the hope is that those congregations that are doing it would make resources available for congregations that, that aren't doing it or aren't in, look, aren't in areas where it's easy to do. Welcoming days of observance. There's about 15 or 16 different days that um, the LGBTQ community has, you know, considered our high holy days and they have meaning and their opportunities just as, you know, a, re a religious uh, institution has, has days and times and seasons that mark, you know, what's happening and, and what's important to us. These are important to the LGBTQ community. Many of us within the LGBTQ community don't know what they are and don't know what they mean. And so as a community together, uh, if, as we practice and, and remind one another of what they mean, then, uh, then they will become, you know, I guess, more traditional. 
a welcoming congregation module. This is the most exciting aspect of the five practices of welcome renewal because a lot of us, um, we need space to learn and to grow and engage. And this is an opportunity for congregations or regions to, um, and, the, and the UUA as an institution to provide resources for, for folks to learn. So the UUA is committing to offering at least one webinar per year uh, that will engage an issue or a topic that uh, around LGBTQ faith and inclusion. And so congregations are, are, are invited to participate in that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we, as we go a little deeper. And then the final uh, practice is uh, support a welcoming project. And I alluded to this earlier in the intro that um, you know, this is an opportunity to flank um, other institutions uh, and, 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 help, and support them both financially and physically. <clears throat> so, uh, next slide, please. So becoming a welcoming congregation, as I mentioned before, um, becoming a welcome congregation is the expectation of every Unitarian Universalist congregation. All over 800 congregations are currently approved. Nearly 300 congregations that are not are encouraged to fulfill the original objectives of the welcoming congregations program. Not too much more to say about that, but that if you're not welcoming, we encourage you to do the same, to, to become a welcoming congregation. And we'll be reaching out to you actually, if you're not welcoming, to work with you on how to do that. And the second, next slide, please. Uh, the second is uh, welcome work, welcoming, the second practice of welcome renewal is incorporating welcoming worship service into our ordinary calendar of worship every year. These services might occur during the LGBTQ Pride Month or any other day of observance an LGBTQ marriage ceremony, naming ritual, or remembrance ceremony may also uh, fulfill the objective. The hope is that um, as congregations uh, practice the five practices of welcome and uh, you know, certify, if you will, or update, or let us know, essentially, because we're not, we're going to try to move away from the approval, disapproval, application process, and into a more coaching consulting experience. So as congregations begin practicing uh, the five practices of welcome, we'll have liturgies available to support other congregations. So if one church uh, do, is, is doing a thing, other congregations will be able to, to see that and borrow from what, an, what, what other congregations are doing. Hey, Michael. Uh, yes. Um, it looks like you have a whole webinar to do about this. And I think we ought to encourage people to do it when you can do the whole thing and take time with it. But I think we'd love to talk about those five practices of welcome for a little bit with a panel. Would that be okay? That would be fantastic. Okay. Cause I, and I think if you have a time, I'm sure that a lot of viewers would love to actually spend the time to go into this whole thing. Cause it looks like a really good presentation. And I'm, yeah, so I, I'm offering orientations beginning uh, two weeks a month, beginning and, and um, Two, two days a month beginning in, in, in January. So throughout well, the year, I in several so can, the Facebook groups where folks yeah, can, can promote those orientations because I, you know, this looks like a good two hour discussion that I'd love to think about for both CLF and for this little bricks and mortar that I'm hanging out in. But can we go back to the uh, five practices of welcome and just talk about those? Because those in and of themselves are profound. And I see another host has joined us today. Yes, and I just, well, without the slide presentation or what have you, I will just, you know, just for the sake of, so the conversation is grounded, uh, the, the next uh, practice, which would have been the, the third practice, is, um, you know, days of observance. Uh, there's about 12, 12 to 15 of those. We expect congregations to recognize at least six per year, any six that they choose. And recognition means a story for all ages or a chalice lighting or, um, or perhaps a sermon, or even just music, or even a bulletin cover, just something naming that, that we're aware and that we see the folks that are in our congregation. The fourth is the, the webinar seminar, which again, we uh, at the UUA are committed to providing, but also congregations may, may create their own. Uh, and we expect perhaps a 10% of membership to be involved in that. And then finally, supporting your congregation, the ask is a financial commitment, but that's not, it's not limited to that. 
perhaps a plate share on one of the worship Sundays, perhaps, and uh, we'll have a clearinghouse of about eight to 10 different organizations that are intersectional that folks can engage uh, just to show uh, that, that, that we are aware of the work that folks are doing outside of uh, our congregations and outside of Unitarian Universalism. So those are the five practices of welcome. Thanks. So, Thanks so, much. Mm -hmm. so I, I, you know, I think these are really exciting. And as someone, you know, so I serve a congregation that went through the welcoming congregation procedure in 1999. So we'll, we'll be a welcoming congregation for 20 years next year and has never submitted a renewal Though, though we've done stuff, clearly. I mean, they have a queer minister. So <laughs> we, we've done stuff and we've actually engaged our own sort of internal renewal process, but I'm, I'm certain we're not alone in the fact that we've never submitted anything to, to renew our status. But you know, one of the things that excited me when we talked about it, I took Michael's webinar um, and, and there were, it, it was a small group that, that, that Thursday and, uh, and we talked a bunch about this intersectionality um, issue. And I'm wondering, so I hear you describe this and it would be really easy for congregations to pick the things that reinforce that sort of white comfort, uh, class comfort, uh, gender binary <laughs> comfort um, and just sort of check those boxes. And I'm wondering, uh, I guess, what you know like what you've seen congregations do or what you hope congregations do that break us out of that um like do you have examples of of things that that you've seen congregations do that fit in your practices um that yeah that well, break us that, out of that. The, thank you for the question i think that that has been one of the the flaws of, of our welcoming congregations program is that there hasn't been that opportunity to engage again folks send in send in a package once and then that's it. And, I, and so I think that the first has to do with uh, diagnosing that's, that, that issue as, and the best way to do that is to begin a relationship, right? It's really easy, it would be really easy for me as a you know, black queer man working for an institution uh, to say, you're not doing it right or to make an assumption that all the congregations are, 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 are being, um, you know, white in their in their programming. I think that in order to address that issue first, we have to create and build a relationship before I'm able to feel comfortable making that critique, as well as take be accountable for not for the institution not providing the resources. Right? All we've said is um, all we've had with folks is standing on the side of love, which is now side with love. Uh, we've celebrated well, uh, um, um, marriage equality and we've created logos and ribbons and that's what they've done. So then for me to turn around and say, well, now you're only doing it white is a little unfair, I think. I think that um, I have to first create resources. And so some of what I'm hoping to do and what I've already done, perhaps through Uplift, our, our social media and programming plat uh, messaging platform for LGBTQ issues at, issues at the UUA is, con is share stories and invite people to write and invite people to, uh, to, to learn about intersectionality within the queer experience. And so again, that's why I go back to my commitment as LGBTQ and intercultural program is to help congregations get there, but not without providing too hard, harsh of a critique that they're not there or haven't been there. Well, maybe Michael and I as white queer people can provide that critique then that you're, you're not uh, in a good position to provide as a staff person and a person of color. Because I think what Michael you're saying, and I saw all the time is white churches saying, oh, we're doing diversity. Look, we have white gay men, rich men, and look, look how diverse we are. And so I think that's why I got so frustrated. I was like, that's a tiny bit of who we're talking, as you said, that's not the queer community. And so, um, so I've been, we've had, you know, a number of guests talking and I, I really appreciate Michael how very tactfully you said that and it's why you're great at your job and I'm not there anymore. <laughs> but, um, but I do think for people who are listening, part of, I think Rebecca Parker said once when she was on, leave your comfort zone and go somewhere else. And, like have an experience, like just, 
you know, stop believing that your congregation is the center of this. And I think you lift that up when you say financially supporting other organizations, but also going where other people are and experiencing life in a, in a different kind of a way, I think is a huge um, endeavor for, con I mean, and I'm not talking about the whole congregation getting on a bus, and going to a bar or something, God, no, but, um, you know, really the leadership in so many of the organizations dealing with white supremacy is huge numbers of queer people are doing it. I mean, so that the intersectionality is in the queer groups and in that, in my, at least here in Minneapolis, those, those groups are so interwoven that you really don't have to look super hard to start really seeing life differently. Yes, and, and that's certainly the case. The resources are, uh, are, are there and congregations can begin doing that work. You can begin having these conversations within your congregations. I think that there are people within your congregations who are already equipped to do the work, but I think creating a framework that, that fosters that and that encourages that conversation, I expect uh, it to be uh, uh, difficult before it becomes, um, you know, simple, but whenever you, uh, you know, for instance, the annual webinar experience will be a learning experience. Folks will, folks will be gagged, if, 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 if you will, around like what folks know and what folks don't know, and what folks understand and what folks don't understand. And I think that, um, uh, encouraging, you know, congregations to enter into an annual uh, engagement together around what the queer experience is about for all people is going to force those conversations and force those relationships and and bring to the surface some of the misunderstandings and and prejudices that that exist within our community and revisit it again the next year and the next year and reach out to me and say, oh my gosh, this happened and this didn't go so well. And what did you mean by this? And your resources are not at all helpful. And I can say, oh my God, are, are they not? I thought they were, let me, re let me revisit them. Rather than after 18 years or 30 years, uh, realizing that, 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 that the resources haven't been working. But I think this annual engagement, this relationship, this ongoing conversation is the best way to um, address the needs of our folk and our learning needs, as well as our um, community engagement over and over and over again, more consistently rather than just once in 30 years or once in five years. And the last um, thing I want to say is that we're moving away from ribbons. So if you're a welcoming congregation, you're supposed to be. If you're not a welcoming congregation, just become one. And if you're practicing the five practices of welcome, you will receive a ribbon at GA. You know what the people want, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, and I'm, I am really um, excited, you know, to hear um, the dedication to and the commitment to intersectionality because one of the things um, that we hear, you know, particularly we heard during the white supremacy teaching um, and the white supremacy controversy of last year is, if you all would only be like it was when we did LGBTQ rights, this would be so much better. Um, you, you know, it, it was that, look at the success that we had with, with that. And if you could just be like that, mm. um, this would be going so much better for you all. Um, and, and boy, that, that was just a, that's a hard one to, to, to respond. I mean, it's not hard to respond to, but it's hard to respond to in a pastoral way sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I think for as much as, um, as we did, you know, for our queer community, um, there was also, you know, damage um, that that was done as well. And so the, the intersectionality of, of this going forward is going to, I think, be key to um, to supporting, you know, the anti-racism, um, rooting out white supremacy that, that we're trying to do as a faith as well. And yeah, that's why I think it's so important to name, uh, you know, what, uh, the, the social location of queer people of color and to talk about our religious histories uh, that have been liberative, right? The black church uh, has been essentially this 
the, the seed of, of, of abolition and, and the civil rights movement. And therefore, I can never at all leave it because it is with me. It is why I am. And, um, you know, uh, imperialism and, 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 and Christian supremacy has in essence uh, left, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, Oh gosh, it's a lot, you know, <laughs> domination and conquest and, and, and have left areas without um, liberating them from theology, from, from, from poor theologies. And so you have a situation where, you know, um, Christianity in Africa and Christianity in African American communities are left with a <laughs> religion that was in place you know, in the 1600s <laughs> and 1700s. Uh, and, and so it's just very complex and that impacts what we believe about women and queer people. And, and, and so when people of color come to Unitarian Universalism, we bring that with us, you know, and you can't uh, just wave a rainbow flag and expect it to all be like whisked away. It's very complicated and very complex. And the reason why, again, in my opinion, and I believe that the research supports it, um, once it's done, <laughs> um, uh, many people of color come here because we're queer and, and, and because of that theology. And if we're not addressing uh, you know, this within our welcoming program, it's not about just saying, you know, we've changed the bathrooms and we have a flag out front. It's about how are we still dismantling those systems of domination that are driving people, one of which is homophobia, transphobia, and, and all the other obvious. Well, on that note, which is, I think, central to this show and to all of our mission, thank you so much. And um, Jessica, were you able to promote when those webinars will take place? because we'd like to encourage everyone listening to attend the full webinar on this. I know I'll be there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you put it in the, I'll, yeah. I'll push it yes, out. I will share the link. Um, I will yeah. share the link in our chat space and then- um, That's great. You can amplify. So Jessica will share that. So anybody who um, says I want more, which hopefully everybody does, um, can go to that. Next week, we are going to do a year in review talking about some of the cool stuff that's happened and some of the hard stuff that's happened too. But um, some of uh, talking about some of the highlights here on this show and what's gone on in Unitarian Universalism and the world. So uh, join us for that. Thank you again, Michael Crumpler from New York City, Michael Tino from Peekskill, New York, and Asia, Christina, and Jessica. See you next time. And thanks to all of you who joined us.